Hello everybody. I'm going to carry on with the next few chapters of Running on the Roof of the World by Jess Butterworth. Can you guess where in school I am today? Okay, chapter 17, Journey. Of course we left it, didn't we? We were, the two of them had taken the two yaks and were about to set off on their journey. Okay. Eve steps into a ditch and I slide forward, slamming into the hump above her shoulders. Sorry Eve, I mutter, shuffling back to find my balance. Being a yak rider should run in my blood, but my legs muscles ache from clinging on so tightly. We approach the thick wire fence that surrounds the village. Two rocks stand in our right like giant guards. Please let it be clear. Sam dismounts. He moves slowly towards them, crushing the gravel under his boots. There's no one here, he shouts. Is the fence still broken, I ask. He nods and disappears between the rocks with Bones. Of course, Bones is the other yak, isn't it? I follow him. The rusty fence has bowed to the ground where the boulder fell and flattened it. The space between the rocks is just big enough to squeeze Eve through. But I have to tug at her harness just to get her to move. As I step over the fence, my heart jumps. We're escaping. I spot Sam looking at the vast empty grasslands walled in on all sides by the barren foothills. Bones makes a beeline for the path and Sam tugs him back, back into the overgrown grass. We have to reach the rocky hills in the distance. I calculate it'll take us about six more hours to arrive. Beyond the hill, the huge mountains rise out of the ground, grey and dappled with bright white snow. I've never felt so small. Did you see the police take anyone else away? I ask Sam. He shakes his head. I know the man on fire had family in town, though. They'll lock anyone away connected with him. I wish he hadn't done it, I whisper. There's no one to help us now. Don't you see, Tash? That's why he did it. Who's going to stand up for us? How do we get our voices heard? I glance backwards. The houses are tiny dots on the horizon. My parents are still close by, I'm sure. I picture them huddled in a dark cell. I only know one person who returned from the prison. If the Wu Jing think Dad was involved with the man on fire, they'll never let him out. And there's even less chance if they know about the leaflets. Sam stares at the ridge jutting out of the mountain and the white steps that spiral up there. His gaze is distant and I know why. It's the place of the sky burials and the last time we travelled there was when he's for his mum. Bones stops in front of me. What is it? I ask. Sam nods towards a group of farmers heading across the fields. Come here, he says, jumping off bones. He fastens my coat all the way up so that just my nose and eyes stick out. I breathe in the earthy scent of Dad. You really could be my brother, Sam smiles, looking at me in my short hair. Wandering nomads, I grin back. I realise it's not even a lie. I have no home now. If anyone asks, says Sam, we're just taking these yaks to our father. We ride on in silence. The axe hooves stood on the grass. Eyes forward, sit up straight. Most importantly, don't slide off. The farmers are on their hands and knees, slicing the grass with their sides. They don't even look up at, look up at us. We pass them and I feel a little flutter of victory. Hours go by and the sun shines from its highest point. With each person we pass, I grow in confidence until I see them. Chapter 18, Letter. A line of uniformed soldiers sweeps across the fields in the distance. Farmers scramble out of their way. My heart beats faster. Sam, I say, pulling up alongside him, look. The panic on his face tells me he's seen them too. He slides off, grabs Eve's reins, and tugs us towards a thick line of bushes marking the field border. Bone's thick horns stick out over the top of them. 
right down, Sam hisses at him. Bones lowers his head and munches on the grass. As long as he keeps eating, they won't be able to see him, I say. Sam presses his fence against the hedge. Your dad always said that if anything like this happened, they'd tighten the military and put the whole area under lockdown. No one would be allowed to move in or out. I frown at Sam. I think we'll have to wait until it gets dark, he continues. But we can't risk wasting any time, I say, watching the soldiers march forward, march forwards. The men with the trucks will be waiting for us. Tash, Sam says quietly, you're wanted by these people. If you go out there, they'll question you. They'll find out who you are and what you've got. I sit onto the ground, wishing that I could sneak past the soldiers and hating the idea of waiting. Even bones stop eating and look up at me. I take the, back off my, the bag off my back and tear it open. The prayer bowl clatters onto the ground. I think back to the night the soldiers came. Dad told me to keep the backpack safe. There must be something important in here. The copy of the snow lion lies crumpled at the bottom. I gather it in my hands and scan the pages. Then a piece of paper falls onto my lap. It's a letter. In each corner is a drawing of a quarter of a moon. Dear old friend, how are the yaks? If you need some more, I'll be passing soon. Hopefully we will fly through the mountains and not stumble on the high passes and snow like the last time. My herd is currently 11 strong. See you in December or November at the earliest. Yours, Rinchin. A praying mantis lands on the top of the right corner of the page and I blow him off. We will get there, says Sam, eyes glued to the hedge. I keep searching, brushing the letter aside and digging in the bag. There's nothing else in there. I slide my hand inside and feel around the hem. Maybe there's something hidden in the seam secretly. It's empty. It's too much to take in. My head is spinning. I snap a strand of glass be grass between my fingers, each piece marking a countdown of the seconds. I want to be on the move. The soldiers are getting near, says Sam. Hide! I dive towards the bottom of the hedge. The ground is damp and cold. Bugs move along the soil all around me. Sam keeps a lookout through the bush branches. Bones finishes eating and lifts his head up. I grab a handful of grass, holding it out to him. Come on, I whisper, eat it. Bones eyes it for a second before lowering his hand and munching the grass out of my hand. Bits stick out of the side of his leathery mouth. I pray it was quick enough and the soldiers didn't spot his horns over the hedge. I turn and peer through the branches. The soldiers swish past the long grass, poking at the bushes with their sharp bayonets. Bones shakes his head. What was that? asks the soldier. Yeah, I heard something too, says another. I throw my hand out to Bones. Don't stick your head up now. The soldiers edge closer, slicing the leaves in half with their knives. My heart beats so hard I'm sure they must be able to hear it. A bayonet sticks straight through the hedge, coming out right above me. Its blade glints in the light, catching the sun. Ten centimetres lower, and it would have got me. I lean away from the hedge. Sam shuffles backwards. There's something here, a soldier says. I heard it. The hedge rustles. Luckily, a pheasant squawks and flies out next to us and up into the sky, its long tail flicking behind it. It was just a stupid bird. Come on then, we've got enough land to cover today. I place my hands flat on the ground and gasp shallow breaths. Sam shakes his head. That was far too close. I nod. What will happen when they reach our village? I don't want to know, says Sam. You'll be all right, you know, I say, squeezing his, ha his hand. Your dad, I mean. But I don't know that. I don't know anything for sure. Chapter 19. Grasslands. At dusk, the crickets sound and the fireflies dance. The fields become a lake of twinkling lights. Even bones are lying down with their heads resting on each other. 
Come on, Eve, I say. Time to go. She opens her brown eyes and looks up at me. I rest my forehead against her coarse hair. She grunts. I know she thinks I'm mad, but she lifts her feet and stands. We climb onto the yaks and set off, one step closer to finding the Dalai Lama and saving my parents. Above us, the stars shine brightly. We live on the roof of the world, says Sam. Mum always says that you couldn't get much closer to the stars than this. When India collided with the rest of Asia, the mountains were pushed up out of the earth towards the sky. I was thankful to be on Eve, above the grasses swirling with humming hummingbugs and snakes. I thought there'd be something important in the, in, in the back, like I said, but there's only the leaflet and that letter. What letter? asks Sam. Let me see. He slows bones down and we stop. He shines the torch through his fingers to limit the light and stares at his right at the writing. Dad's name is Rinchin, I say, confused by the signature at the end. It's so now. This isn't a letter, Tash, whispers Sam. It's a secret message. My breath catches. How do you know? I ask. It must be. It's not addressed to anyone. Why else would your dad have it? I knew there was something important in that bag, I say, trying to keep my voice down, my stomach fluttering. Dad told me there was some information he was trying to pass on. I bet this is it. No, we just have to crack it, Sam grins. We hurry on through the darkness, stopping along the way to steal glances at the letter with the torches. After what seems like forever, I recognise the big rock jutting out of the ground. It marks the place where the grasslands cross the road. We're almost there, I whisper. I spot the dark shape of a truck parked off road. Specks of light shine through the cracks in the back door. Maybe it's a trap. I slide off Eve and tiptoe silently towards the truck, leaving her behind me. Sam flashes the torch on and off as a signal. I hear the click of a door opening and footsteps as a figure paces towards us. A torch beam flashes in my face and I shield my eyes, unable to see who it is. You're lucky, says the man, his husky voice telling, uh, his husky, his, excuse me, his husky voice tells me it's the older one. We were just about to give up and leave. We weren't certain you'd be here at all, says Sam. I gave you my word, he says. That's important in times like this. My mind spins with the thought of the money. We have to get in the truck before they, they discover that we don't have any more. Sam switches his torch on too. The man's moustache is outlined in the shadow. I'm Jinpa, he says, holding out his hand. There were soldiers back there, I say. We should go. We follow him to a ropey green truck parked on a slant with two wheels on the road and two wheels up the hill. The young man from the square leans against the passenger door watching us. Jinga tugs the creaking, the creaking back door open. It forms a ramp. Inside it's bigger than I expect and the back is filled with giant masks, materials and costumes that hang from the ceiling. It smells of dust and mothballs. I notice a woman sitting on round cushions on the floor. She's short, with scruffy hair and soft cheeks. What are you doing with the yaks? asks Jimper. Your best bet is to set them free and point them in the direction of home. No, Sam and I say in unison. We need them for our journey, I add. And we promise to look after them, Sam explains. I smiled at him. Jimper stares at the yaks. They can't come. I'll watch them, the woman says, standing up and climbing out. There won't be any trouble. Jinga looks too tired to argue. He shrugs his shoulders. Get them inside, then, he says. I nod and pray that the truck can fit us all in. Moonlight shines into the back, reflecting off the metal walls. I walk up the ramp, leading Eve. She takes one step up and stops. I tug at her gently. She tosses her head from side to side and tries to turn round. The lead slips out of my hand and she backs away. Let's try Bones first, says Sam quickly, leading him up to the truck. This time I stand behind Bones and push him back. He's not budging! I lean my body weight against him. I try again to get Eve inside the truck, but she increases her protests, stamping her foot, eyes wide and nostrils flared. You'll have to leave without them, says Jimper. 
I think of Manny. The journey across the mountain seems impossible without the axe. I sink back against the truck side. We're not waiting any longer, hisses Jimpa. You have to, I say. I'm not leaving without those yaks. Then we'll leave without you, Jimpa sighs. He steps up into the, up into the driver's seat and starts the engine. And we're going to leave it there. We'll see if the yaks get into the truck and see where Tash and Sam end up in the next few chapters. See you soon.